to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ prophecy never came by the will of man for holy men of god spoke as they were moved by the holy spirit second peter chapter 1 verse 21 welcome to our study of the book of second peter in this epistle peter reminds us of things that we desperately need to incorporate into our christian life to make sure that we're right with god peter says that he's not going to live in this tent forever that he's going to put this life off and thus there are some things he wants to leave behind some things he wants christians to remember and so in chapter one we're going to notice the key here is for us to remember to grow as a child of God. Growth is one of the important things of being a Christian. Jesus clearly taught His disciples to grow. Matthew 5 verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Peter has already stated in 1 Peter 2 verse 2, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the Word, that you may grow thereby. But how is it that we continue to grow? What, what steps must we take? What avenues must we go down if we're going to grow as God wants us to? In this chapter, we're going to notice several keys that will help us in our spiritual growth. And the first is this. We've got to realize what the source of true growth is. Notice Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3. The Bible says God has given to us in the Scriptures, God has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us. God's divine power has given us these things. And in the Bible, here's what's great, friend. The source of our growth is the Bible, and in it we have everything we need for life, that is to live a good life. John 10 verse 10, Jesus said, I came that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly, but more importantly, to be a godly person. This book, the Bible alone, is the only guide I need. It alone can get me to heaven. I don't need to worry about the books of men. This book is all the truth I need. John 17, 17, Jesus said, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. This book is not only all truth on religious matters. It is from God. From Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22, it is the full and complete will of God. Psalm 119, 160, the psalmist said, The entirety of your word is is truth. Now think about that. The entirety, every word in the Bible is true and right and from God and will get us to heaven. Jesus said it's what sets us free. John 8 verse 32, Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Remember the truth is God's word, therefore we need God's word to be free from sin. Jesus said this to His disciples in the first century. In John 16, 13, He promised them that the Spirit of truth was coming, and when He came, He would guide them into all truth. Not only is this book true, not only is every word from God, but friends, here's what's great about the Bible. It is all truth on religious matters. Friend, we don't need anything but the Bible to get to heaven. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I'm the way the truth, the life, no man comes to the Father except by me. And so the source of our growth is realizing this book is the Word of God. It's all I need to get to heaven. And it, if I'll give myself to it, I'll be right with God. You see, when I stand before God on the day of judgment, this book, the New Testament, is what I'm going to be judged by. Jesus said, He who rejects me does not receive my word, has that which judges him, the word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Now, if the word of God is our source and it's all we need, let's make some practical application. Number one, we do not need books of men to get to heaven and be right with God. 
Friend, it doesn't matter what the number one seller on the New York Times religious book list is. God's not concerned about that. I don't have to know what somebody's favorite preacher wrote about. All I need to get to heaven is God's Word. Books of men will never get you there. In fact, if you start putting your trust in your faith in the books of men, you're going to be led down the wrong path. How do I know that? Jeremiah 10 verse 23 says, O Lord, I know. I know the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man who walks to direct his own steps. Man can't get us to heaven. Only God can. Secondly, if the Word of God is all we need, if it's our source for growth, we surely don't need church manuals to figure out how to worship God and how to be saved. We don't need creed books. We don't need confessions. We don't need prayer manuals. We don't need catechisms. All those manuals and books written by men are foolish waste of time when it comes to getting right with God. You can't worship God correctly that way. And you sure can't learn how to be saved from books of men. The Bible says this, There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. Proverbs 14, verse 12. Let's realize God's book, the Bible, is all we need to get to heaven. And friend, we sure don't need to put our faith. We don't need to look to men's books for the way of salvation. Many people want to put their faith in things like the sinner's prayer or the ABCs of salvation, something that men have made up, some book that or track that a man has wrote. Friend, that won't get anybody to heaven. It's going to lead you away from the Word of God very likely and down the path to destruction. So what's the source for our growth? The source for growth is always the Word of God. What about the motivation? We notice in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, clearly teaches that God has given to us exceedingly great and precious promises in the Scripture. What is it that motivates me? I know the source is the Word of God, but what motivates me to want to grow? These exceedingly great and precious promises by which I can become a partaker of the divine nature. I can be like God if I follow the Scriptures and put my hope in His promises. Think about some of the exceedingly great and precious promises we have today. I've got the promise that death is not the end for the child of God. Psalm 116 verse 15, the Bible says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. The Bible says in Revelation 14 verse 13, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. That's a precious, exceeding great promise we have. We have precious promises like that of the forgiveness of sins. Jesus clearly taught, Matthew 26, 28, as He instituted the Lord's Supper, He said this, representative of His blood is my blood of the new covenant shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. God said, I'll cast all your sins into the depths of the sea. Micah 7, verse 18 and 19. God said, as far as the east is from the west, so far will I remove their transgressions from them. Psalm 103, verses 11 and 12. We have so many wonderful and great promises as God's children. The the promise of all spiritual blessings. Ephesians 1, verse 3. The promise and the hope of the resurrection, John 11, 25 and 26, the promise that one day we can live in heaven with God. Matthew 25, verse 46. And so the source of our growth is the Word of God. The motivation is the the promises, these precious promises we have. But notice the additives of our growth. What is it we've got to add to our faith? What is it we've got to incorporate into our Christian life to really grow like God wants us to? Notice 2 Peter chapter 1, what the Scripture says in verse 5 following. Here the Bible says, For this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness love. Here are the things we've got to incorporate, the additives that we've got to put in our Christian life if we're really going to grow. You might ask, what areas do I need to grow in? Well, look at these again. It begins with faith. Faith is the foundation for growth. What is faith? Faith is trust in God. Romans 10, 17 says we get that faith by reading and studying the Scriptures. Faith 
comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Faith is trusting God based on the Scriptures. It is based on evidence and substance, Hebrews 11 verse 1, and it clearly is a necessity if I'm going to please God. Hebrews 11 6 says, Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that comes to Him must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. So I've got to start with faith. I've got to study the Bible. I've got to understand who God is and that I've got to learn to trust in Him as the Almighty who will always fulfill His promises. Then we add to our faith virtue. Virtue is the idea of moral excellence. We put behind us those immoral things of the world. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11, the Bible says, Such were some of you immoral, idolaters, homosexuals, ungodly, drunkards. Those were the things you used to be, but now when we become a Christian, we rise out of the muck and mire of sin to live a life of virtue. I try every day to be an example to the world. 1 Peter 2, verse 21. I try to be a light, a lamp set on a hill. Matthew 5, verses 14 through 16. I try to be a pattern for those around me to look and see what it means to live the Christian life. And so we've got to have moral excellence. And then we add to our virtue, knowledge. Friend, the addition of knowledge is such an important ingredient in our faith. As Jesus said, you've got to know the truth to be free. But you know, knowledge doesn't come cheap. It requires diligent work and effort on our part. The Bible says in Proverbs 23, verse 23, buy the truth and sell it not. We've got to work diligently to grow and gain the knowledge that God wants us to. And that happens by studying the Scriptures. Paul told Timothy, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Peter said in 1 Peter 3, verse 15, we need to be ready always. And again, to be ready, you've got to get ready. You've got to search the Scriptures daily. Acts chapter 17, verse 11. You've got to give attention to reading of the Word of God. 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. And you've got to grow, not remain in the same state in which you're baptized, not remain in that knowledge state, but as Hebrews 5, verse 12 through 14 says, you've got to grow to the point where you can learn and teach others beyond just the first principles of Christ. And then to our knowledge, we add self-control. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 12, Paul said, I'll not be brought under the power of any. We've got to let Jesus be the one who controls our life, and we've got to have the self-control to not do those things that we might want to at some times. Paul said in Romans 7 that sometimes the body made him want to do things. Sometimes our lusts and desires of the flesh were very strong. We've got to have the control to say no to ourselves. That's the idea of self-control, making sure that we can tell ourselves no, that we buffet our body and bring it into subjection. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 27, that we realize that our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and that we give God the glory for it through it. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. And so I add to my knowledge, self-control and the self-control perseverance. Perseverance is the idea of sticking in there never giving up, remaining faithful, enduring in the midst of and in the face of trials. Friends, perseverance is what's going to keep us going when the going gets tough. The Bible says to certain Christians, or said to certain Christians in Revelation 2, some of you are about to be thrown in prison for a period of about 10 days. The writer then said, you be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life, Jesus said. Friends, we've got to have the perseverance to stick in there to never give up and to realize that heaven will be worth it all. Add to your perseverance, then he says godliness. This is the idea of being like God. God's character must be brought into our lifestyle. Be holy as he who called you is holy. 1 Peter 1 verses 14 and 15. We're to have the mind of Christ. Philippians 2 verse 5. We're to speak as the oracles of God, Ephesians 4.11, and we're to do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith, Galatians 6, verses 6 through 10. And then with our godliness, part of growth 
is that we develop brotherly kindness. That is, we have the relationship, the tender relationship between other Christians that we should. Hebrews 13, 1, the Bible says, Let brotherly love continue. Well, what's a good example of brotherly kindness? It's the willingness to look out and be concerned about the others, others in the body of Christ. Jesus taught his disciples this. In John 13, verse 34 and 35, and Jesus said, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, you also love one another. In that context, Jesus bent down and washed the feet of the disciples and he said, You love one another like this. That's brotherly kindness. And then we must also have love. Add your brotherly kindness, love. Love, my friends, is not just a feeling. It's a feeling based on obedience to the will of God. Love always requires trust and obedience. The Bible says, Jesus speaking in John 14, 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. Love always does what the Master asks. And love, my friends, seeks the best in others. If we love others, true love will speak the truth in love. Ephesians 4 and verse 15. And so here are some areas that each of us can grow in. But friend, I want you to realize also from 2 Peter chapter 1, the necessity of growing. 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 9 through 11, notice what the scripture says. Concerning this addition of these things, Paul says, or Peter says, he who lacks these things <clears throat> is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you'll never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Friends, growing in Christ is not an option. It's not something you can do if you feel like. It is an absolute necessity if we're going to be right with God. Friend, do we realize that if we don't grow, we're going to fall away and be lost. The idea that once you become a Christian, you can never be lost is so far from the teaching of the New Testament that it's outlandish. Galatians 5 verse 4, Paul said to Christians, you have become severed from Christ, you have fallen from grace. Christians in the first century fell from grace. Revelation 3 verses 4 and 5, Jesus said to some in the church there that their names were in jeopardy of being written out of the book of life. If they weren't careful, they're going to have their ta names taken out of that book. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12, we're told to take heed lest ye fall. And the clearest of all, Acts chapter 8 verse 20 through 22, Simon obeys the gospel. He becomes a Christian. His former life takes hold of him, hold of him again and he tries to buy the Holy Spirit with money and Peter said, your money, listen, perish with you. Peter's money is going to perish, or Simon's money was going to perish, but he also was going to perish. Simon was going to be lost if he didn't repent and pray to God that the evil thought of his heart might be forgiven him. Here's a man who just became a Christian. He went back to his old ways. He was a Christian. He went back to his old ways, and he was again in a lost state. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 27, Paul said, I buffet or discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. Castaway from what? If Paul didn't keep his life in line with the teaching and preaching that he gave, he was going to be a castaway from God, no longer a part of God's family. And so is it a necessity that I grow? Absolutely. If we don't grow, we can't be right with God. And then, my friends, as we think about things that will help us grow, we need to have the attitude for growth. I think that attitude is found in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, and it is a firm belief in the inspired Word of God. Notice 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 20. The Bible says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation or origin, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. What's an attitude that will help me want to grow? The idea that this book, this, this Bible, the Word of God, is the very words from the God of heaven is an attitude that will help us grow. When I realize this is not just a book 
written to people 2,000 years ago. This is the very voice of God speaking to men and women today. My friends, that's the attitude we need. All Scripture, we need to realize all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This book is from God and it gives me everything I need to be right with Him. I need to realize that the law of the Lord is perfect. Psalm 19, verses 6 through 8. I need to understand that by this book, a man is born again. We're born again by the Word of God which lives and endures forever. It's through obedience, study, and growth of the Word of God that I can be saved. Receive with meekness the implanted Word which is able to save your soul. James 1 verse 21. And realize what Paul said in Romans 1 verse 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. This is God's power for salvation. And friends, the attitude I need is, this is the very words off the, the mouth of God, the tongue of God, and how I desperately need to incorporate them into my life. And so the attitude for growth, is a firm belief. One attitude is a firm belief in the inspiration of the Scriptures. Now, friend, to really be right with God, you've got to make sure that you are a child of His. Before growth can take place, you've got to make sure that you're in the body, that you are part of the family of God. Friend, realize today that Jesus built His church and that salvation is found in it. Jesus didn't build a multitude of denominations. Jesus didn't, didn't build a religious group on every corner, and you can't just choose the church of your choice to be right with God. Jesus built one church, and in that church is where salvation exists. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church upon this rock. I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus didn't build Peter's, and he didn't build John's, and he didn't Paul, build Paul's church. Jesus built his church. The church belongs to Christ. Romans 16, verse 16, the Bible says, The churches of Christ greet you. Jesus purchased the church with his own blood. Acts 20, verse 28, He paid the price, it belongs to him, and it must give him the honor and the glory. And friend, you've got to be a part of the church Jesus built to be saved. Friend, be sure the Bible says there's just one church. Ephesians 1, verse 22 and 23, God put all things under His feet, gave Him to be head over all things to the church, which is His body. And so the church is the body. We turn then to Ephesians 4, verse 4, and the Bible says there is one body. If the church is the body, and if there's one body, how many churches are there? Just one. God built one church. It belongs to His Son, the church, the Lord Jesus Christ. And my friends, you must be in it to be saved. How do we know that? 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24, the Bible says that Jesus is coming to receive the kingdom, going to receive the kingdom and bring it to the Father with glory. What's the kingdom? Kingdom's the church. Matthew 16, verse 18 and 19. If the kingdom is the church and the kingdom is going to the Father, I've got to be in the kingdom to be saved. Now, how do I get in the church? How do I become a part of the Lord's body? You may be asking yourself. Friend, you do that by obeying God's plan of salvation. Put aside what all you've heard. Put aside what all people have taught you. And just listen to what God has to say about salvation. The Bible says you've got to hear. You've got to listen to the Word of God and it alone. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Have you heard what God says about salvation? Are you willing to accept the Bible as the only authority to get you to heaven? Once you make up your mind that the Bible is God's Word, it's all we need to get to heaven, then you've got to believe in Jesus. The Scripture says in John 8, 24, Jesus said, Unless you believe that I am He, you will surely die in your sins. But belief alone won't save you. Oh, it's true, you've got to believe in Jesus, but belief alone won't save. You can't be saved until you do all God says you've got to do to be saved. And the Scripture says you must repent before you can be saved. 
Luke 13, 3, Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. I've got to change my way of thinking and change my way of life. And friends, once you've repented, you've got to confess the name of Jesus before men. In Acts chapter 8, Philip and the Ethiopian nobleman are riding down the road. They come to a certain water. Here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? He gives the condition, if you believe with all your heart, Jesus is the Christ, you may. He says, I believe. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He made that good confession. And you must be baptized in water for the forgiveness of sins. So many people teach error when it comes to baptism. Listen to what God says. Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark 16, 16. Peter said, Baptism doth now also save us. 1 Peter 3, 21. Jesus again said, Unless a man is born of water... And the Spirit, he shall not enter the kingdom of God. John 3, verse 5. Peter said in Acts 2, verse 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. Ananias said by inspiration of the Holy Spirit to Saul, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Friend, can you get to heaven? Can you be saved without understanding God's teaching on baptism? Absolutely not. And once you've obeyed God's will, as our lessons suggest to us, teach to us today, you've got to grow and be faithful unto death. Christianity, obeying the gospel of becoming Christian, is not the end. That's the beginning. From that point on, I grow and mature as a Christian, trying to bring others to Jesus as well. Jesus said, you be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. As a child of God, ask yourself, have you been growing have you been studying your Bible like you ought to? Have you been praying and asking God for help? Have you been trying to do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith? And friend, are you trying to reach the lost? Evangelism is an important part of growth. Who are you trying to teach the gospel to? Are you trying to reach somebody? Are you trying to help them understand what you've come to know? If not, my friend, then you're not growing and you need to repent and make it right with God. Peter said, I want to remind you of these things while I've still got opportunity. And friend, we want to do the same. Don't ever give up. Always remain faithful and continue to grow in the knowledge of Christ. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905, or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the gospel of Christ.